All right, we are back with another one in my apparently latest series of videos. <laughs> uh, this one, Richard Brown reacts. Yeah, that's me, Richard Brown, I guess. And I'm reacting to philosophy. So far, I've been reacting to this Quine discussion, which has been great. But um, I, came, I saw in the course of checking some stuff out that um, there's a, a video of Herbert Feigl. Um, I'm a big fan of. You guys may or may not know this, but uh, my personal background belief is I really like, uh, I'm interested in the identity theory, the mind-brain identity theory. In fact, I've wanted to teach a course on the history of this for, for a while. I um, never have got to go ahead to do so, but maybe someday. Anyway, the point is that I, I enjoy this sort of stuff. Um, and so, you know, the... By the way, the person I was remembering last time from the 50s was uh, UT Place. So we were talking about that Quine video, and I was like, really, there was nothing in the 50s? Um, but... Uh, Anyway, certainly the view seems to be of coalescing around in the 50s um, that the mind was simply nothing more than the brain. When we're talking about phenomenal consciousness, at least, uh, maybe you could extend that to things like occurring thoughts or judgments or something, but that's a different question. So anyway, I saw this. Uh, so, you know, the big ones are UT Place, JJC Smart, Herbert Feigl, um, I think those are the big three of the early da David Armstrong, David Lewis uh, come in with a slightly different view, but a, a kind of identity theory. Um, if you know the history of this stuff. Anyway, so I saw this discussion between Paul Firebond, Firebend, Firebond, I don't know how to say it, and Herbert Feigl. So I don't know very much about uh, Firebond, but I, and I never had a class on Feigl or anything like that, but I read, you know, the mental and the physical, and I thought about it a lot because I'm interested in these issues. So I thought, this is great. we got to check this out. Um, so that's what I have over here. It says it's from 1962. So it looks like the way the video is organized here. Um, it says, uh, yo. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, for 30 minutes, Feigl talks, and then for roughly 20 minutes or so, Firebond talks, and then they have some discussion for about a half hour or so. Okay. Um, so we'll see what happens. I don't know. Maybe this isn't going to work, but I am curious. To, I've never heard Feigl's uh, voice, and I'm curious to hear what they're going to talk about. I think, they have, I think they're talking about the mind-body problem. I think that's what the description was telling me. So let's check it out. Oh, yeah, and it's, uh, it says the audio is not great on, on this. I didn't turn my audio up. I wonder if I should do that. Let me see. Any misunderstanding that could possibly arise in this building? We are not going to talk about psychosomatic medicine. We are not going to talk about... All right, hold on. Let me see if there's something I can do about this. Probably not, because I am completely inept. <laughs> Um, I don't want to go too, uh, you know me guys, this seems like it's coming in in the middle of a conversation. I wonder where this is from. Does it say, it doesn't say, it says, uh, they discussing my body problems, the Minnesota philosophy of science center source of the original audio is here. Oh, I didn't see that before. Um, Page not found. Yeah. Okay. Bummer. Um, let's check that out. Is that the right one? Yeah, it's this one. Yeah. Let's see if this is any better. Ladies and gentlemen, to prevent any misunderstanding that could possibly arise in this building, we are not going to talk about psychosomatic medicine. We are not going to talk about psychiatry, at least not as far as I'm concerned. We are philosophers. Okay, so we're not going to talk about medicine, psycho, psychosomatic medicine or anything like that, or psychiatry. So when I talk about the mind and the body relationship, he, he's just setting the stage there because this is 1962. So he's saying, look, we're not here to talk about how the mind and the body, how, how, you know, how we can cure one by interacting with the other, like cure the mind by interacting with the body. So, okay, I get what's going on here. So that makes us specialists uh, in the field of generalities. <laughs> we, we 
talk about the mental and the physical. He said we are philosophers, so that makes us specialties in the field of generalities. <laughs> nyak, nyak. <laughs> Someone taught me that I can go back or forth five seconds by pressing arrow keys thusly. Ooh. <laughs> Psyche, obviously the Greek word translates psychology and soma for body. So psyche, soma, mind, body. Scientists, uh, medical people, be of some interest to uh, reassemble scientists, uh, medical people, and possibly psychologists to hear what philosophers uh, traditionally and currently worry about in connection with the old puzzle that the famous 19th century German philosopher Schopenhauer called the Weltknoten, the world knot, that's K-N-O-T in the last syllable. That's a famous quote, by the way, from Schopenhauer, the world nods, that there's this like, you know, it's a mix of all these different problems, metaphysics, epistemology, ontology, philosophy of language, semantics, the whole, it just, uh, everything kind of comes in, it touches the mind-body problem at some point. That's the quote. Okay, interesting. But as he considered the problem of the relation of the mental to the physical or of mind and matter, the key problem of modern philosophy, the central issue, which is so badly tied up in knots that uh, nobody has been able to unravel it. I have tried my hand for more than 40 years, I'm ashamed to confess, on this problem, often not, not all the time. And I have... 40 years, so he's saying he's been working on the mind-body problem since the 20s, since this is 62. <clears throat> I didn't know that. I've only I don't know a lot about Feigl. I only know about the mental and the physical, to be honest with you. Um, and like I said, I never had a class on any of this stuff. That's why I would like to teach a class uh, so that I could delve into the details and get really get into the interesting because I find this stuff all very fascinating. Anyway, <laughs> it's not gonna be another one of those where I'm over here. This is an hour and a half video, so this this first part is only half an hour. I can at least relatively <laughs> let's let's see let's see no secure solutions to offer although i am relatively optimistic about one kind of approach that i will pedal for you uh, a little later the problem is difficult i don't know of any solution that uh, is satisfactory all around perhaps my esteemed friend yeah so you got to start with some humility, right? We don't really know. I think that's the right approach here. We don't really know what the right answer is. Um, we have considerations that point in different directions. I think when it comes to the relation of the mind to the body. Um, and of course, this is a very hot topic right now. But a lot of the debate right now seems to be about, you know, panpsychism or idealism. And not a lot, not a lot of people, but I have been encountering a lot of, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people who seem to think that physicalism or identity theories something like that that, that they uh that they can't make it uh, now of course there's some to defend it you know like ned block and there are others uh, including myself although no one cares what i think but uh so um it would be nice to see some 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 reminders that <clears throat> we don't need to give up on physicalism as of yet so let's hear what he says about it though and colleague uh, may offer you a solution later that will strike you as doing away with the difficulties that I shall raise. Further, by way of prefatory remark, I wish to say that uh, I don't think either of us would uh, question the kind of views that uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, medical people generally make of uh, terminology of the psychosomatic kind. Okay. I think it makes perfectly good sense, for instance, to say, if that's what you're saying, Dr. Hastings, that a uh, 
their gastric ulcer might be caused by suppressed hostility, hostility or repressed hostility. This is possible. Or, I, I mean, it's worth pointing out right here, actually, um, <clears throat> that this sometimes is kind of a flat-footed way of objecting to the thesis of physicalism. They will look, doesn't the mind have some effect on the body? So it's like, you know, some mental stress causes an ulcer, which, by the way, is false in the 60s. Um, it's a bacteria or something, right? It's something else. It's not, it's not stress. But let's suppose that there were some effect of the mind on the body. Um, and, and then someone says, ah, you see, so the mind is not the body because they have, there's one effect in the other. Now, of course, if you're a physicalist, you're going to say, look, no, the mind is physical. So that's just something physical affecting the body, in fact, that's one of the benefits of physicalism is that it allows us to understand how mental things could affect the physical. Um, all right, let's get back to it. That uh, certain hysterical phenomena, which do not seem to be fashionable so much in our time anymore as they used to be in Freud's early days. Wait, what's he talking about? Hold on, let me get to this. Hold on. Or that uh, certain hysterical phenomena, which do not seem to be fashionable so much in our time anymore. I... I see. So he's saying he's not talking about. So if you if you don't know the story about Freud, Freud, of course, wasn't a psychologist. Uh, there was no psychology at the time. Uh, it's a formal discipline. But um, he was a neurologist and he was interest, intrigued by encountering patients who would claim to have certain um, disabilities like being uh, unable to walk, uh, being unable to see. And yet nothing wrong physically with them, no neurological impairment, no physical impairment. So that's what they mean by hysterical. So he says, we're not here to talk about those kind of... And so that's why Freud said these are psychological as opposed to physical um, ailments. <clears throat> because there was nothing physically that he could see wrong, but there was something that seemed to him mentally wrong. Now, of course, you know, I have someone like me would say, yeah, but so if you think the mind is physical, then... He just couldn't see what physical things were wrong, if there were something wrong. Of course, some of the things he thought with disorders weren't and so forth. Anyway, so the point here he's making is um, that that doesn't really count as a strike against it. And we're not going to talk about that kind of stuff here. Okay, interesting. So far, just general stage setting, it seems like. They used to be in Freud's early days, a certain hysterical phenomena that Freud called conversion symptoms may indeed be reactions to mental uh, or social situations in which the uh, subject finds himself and uh, he breaks out with one or the other kind of physical symptom. So I would say the language that we speak already in everyday life and the language that psychologists, medical people and psychiatrists speak is uh, plainly interactionistic, as we philosophers uh, style that. Interactionistic. <laughs> it means they interact, um, the mind and the body, so that, you know, commonsensically, when, if you, if you have a mental episode, it can cause a physical episode, like if I feel an itch, that's a conscious experience, it can cause me to move my hand to scratch it. Um, if I think certain things, it can cause me to do certain things, and vice versa. If you kick me, it can cause an experience of pain, so physical act. So there's interaction. So what he's saying is the way the scientists talk, the way the ordinary person talks, um, we talk as though there's interaction between the mental and the physical. And in fact, this is, I think, an important point because a large reason, a large part of the reason for thinking that physicalism is true is... Um, uh, that, that, that it allows the mind to have a, a role in producing physical outcomes, whereas if it's not physical, then it becomes harder, not impossible. I, I think that it's not impossible, but it's harder to see how um, you get that in a satisfying way. Okay. Meaning by that, that there are causal actions of oh, he the said, mind okay. on the body, yeah. as well as on the body, of the body on the mind. Yeah. If I open my eyes in the morning and I perceive my, my bedroom, well then, according to the uh, psychophysical and psychophysiological explanation, light rays enter my eyes, uh, are refracted by my lens, uh, are, uh, go through the vitreous body, hit the retina, the rods and cones in the retina, set up a certain chemical or electrochemical process in the retina, presumably, which uh, triggers off uh, a nerve impulse or a set of nerve impulses which lead via the optical nerve to the occipital lobe of my brain 
And here is where the so-called miracle happens. When uh, these brain processes actually take place, I perceive something, let us say, the walls and pictures of my bedroom. So he just described the physical chain of events in ge generic form from the uh, light hitting your eye to the brain receiving that information in the occipital lobe, which of course this back lobe where the visual primary visual cortex is. And I think it's a big question begging for him to say that's where the magic happens. It's not clear where the neural correlates of consciousness are, like uh, where, uh, you know, some people might think it's in the frontal part where the consciousness bit is uh, taking place or, you know, importantly, these parts are involved in that when it's taking place or something like that. Um, so, but you would get the point that he's making here is that there's um, this chain of physical events and then and then there's a conscious experience that occurs. There's something that it's like for us to see the colors and so forth. Um, well, uh, here is a transition that some philosophers have called a breaking through an ontological barrier because my perceptions, my sensations, my color vision, my vision of shapes, as of the pictures on the wall of my bedroom, these are mental events, and yet they are very closely related, as far as we can tell on the empirical evidence, to the uh, physical events that happen in my nervous system. Right, so we have these two sets of events that are correlated He's setting up an argument for identity. <laughs> we have these two sets of things which are correlated with each other. So whenever I have a conscious experience, there's some brain activity. Um, no, it's not always true that whenever I have some brain activity, I have conscious experience because I can have brain activity even when I'm not having conscious experience. So then we have to figure out what kind of brain activity results in it. But then we presume there'll be some sort of brain activity, which whenever you have it, you have the conscious experience. And then so we have these, we can sort of hypothesize. So we have this brain state um, B, which whenever you're in it, there's a conscious experience. And then we have this conscious experience, which whenever it occurs, there's also the brain state B. And so we have these, these two things which line up. Now, what, what are we going to do with them? I'm assuming that's where he's going with this. Uh, what do we do? Do we identify him or not? What I do? <laughs> Hit the wrong button. Yet they are different. Wait, hold on. To the uh, physical events that happen in my nervous system. All right, let me start the whole thing over. From, not the whole thing, but just from this little bit so I follow the whole chain of his reasoning. Bedroom. These are mental events, and yet they are very closely related, as far as we can tell on the empirical evidence, yeah. to the uh, physical events that happen in my nervous system. By the way, I know I said let it play. <laughs> but that's an important point, because it could have turned out, this is a point David Chalmers makes in a different paper, um, it could have turned out that we opened up the brain and found that there was no correlation, right, just randomness or no activity at all, or nothing even in there. Uh, so it, it is interesting that we, so we have reason to think that there's a relationship between the physical thing and the mental thing. We just don't know what that relationship is, hence the mind-body problem. Okay, good, so let's continue. Yet they are different. Now I will stress these differences in a moment. Uh, suffice it to see, uh, suffice it to say uh, right now, that the problem with which philosophers, at least since Descartes, if not since Plato, have been wrestling in this connection, really consists of, the, uh, consists of the following quandary. On the one hand, we realize, as increasing knowledge of uh, psychophysics, psychophysiology, neurophysiology, and so on, indicate that there is the most intimate relation between what we call the mental and the physical. And by mental, I mean the totality of all those direct experiences that we call sensations, perceptions, thoughts, volitions, desires, emotions, moods, imagery, and the like. Did I mention volitions? Yes. This is a representative list of the, so the sort of things that psychologists traditionally have studied, at least until the rise of behaviorism. <laughs> yeah, behaviorism. Um. 
So is he, but does he think those things are always conscious? That list of things that he just rattled off? Mm, I wonder if he does. I, so probably at this time I was coming to think so. But all right, so it's like, those are the mental things that he's talking about. Okay. Now, this was the traditional conception of the mental, that here we have a realm of entities or of existences or of processes or events that are different from the physical events and yet closely related, very closely, very intimately related to the events in the central nervous system, particularly in the brain. Oh, I see. So he's just setting up, he's saying this is a traditional picture that you have these two sets of different, these, 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 uh, the physical facts and then also the mental facts and they kind of go along together, but they're separate. Uh, they go along together and that one day unfold together, but they're separate and that they're not the same thing. Um, Okay, so he's just, now he's going to say what the problems with that are. I see what's happening here. All right, let's go. Particularly, perhaps, in the cortex of the brain. Yeah, cortex. Similarly, we have uh, the action of the uh, mind on the body, as we put it in popular parlance. I am saying, I say, for instance, now, in a second, I'm going to raise my arm, and lo and behold, I did it. In other words, my volition, my intention, my, my will, my act of will preceded uh, the uh, physical movement of my arm. And of course, you can trace that back, if you're lucky, neurophysiologically, to the innervation of certain pathways that lead to the muscles of my arm. And in this way, uh, my mind is supposed to act on my, on my body. But again, the question arises as to whether, as to where this connection is the closest, in other words, in which area of the brain is that which corresponds to my uh, act of will or my desire or my intention or my uh, volition, my making up my mind. We have good reason to assume by general analogy that whatever happens in the field of our consciousness or awareness is in some way paralleled by uh, something in the brain. Okay, right. So that's kind of the similar point I was making that every mental thing is going to have some some thing that is correlated with. So we could look for where the volition. The there's a whole literature on this starting and Libet Benjamin Libet those experiments. If you know about that, there's a whole whole <laughs> sub industry people thinking about that stuff. So is that the sort of thing? Um, this is before Libet sixty two. Um, that, is that the sort of thing that he's talking about? So he's trying to say we can find, I, I think, I think he, my guess is what's, what he's saying here is, look, so you have these things, these conscious acts, these things, these mental things that you think are these separate things for every one of them. There's some physical thing in the brain, um, which is correlated with it in the sense that when one is the round, so is the other. Um, and, uh, so we can always go and find what physical thing is correlated with whatever mental thing is around. And then I think he's going to say, and then, so, so what reason do we have to think they're really distinct? That's my guess. I'm, uh, yeah, I wonder where he's going with this. Let me, let's hear. Well, what the philosophers have been wanting to know is what is this relation between the mental and the physical? Yeah. Descartes at the beginning of modern philosophy told us that the relation is frankly one of interaction between two substances. The extended substance of body and the non-extended, non-spatial uh, substance of the mind or the soul. Right. Now, so Descartes says, yeah, there's, there's two kinds of substances. One is extended. Extended just means it takes up space. Um, and so his definition of what it means to be a physical object is to be an extended object that can be re that takes up a certain space, but can, you know, be restructured, take up different spaces um, so that there's a fundamental physical stuff called matter out there that can be, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, so modern physics disagrees with that because modern physics, well, it depends on how you, I mean, Particle physics disagrees with that because particles are not extended. Maybe string theory can be all right with that because strings are extended. I don't know. There's a big discussion about that. We don't have to get into that unless people care about it. But um, 
Right. So I think he's just setting up the problem, right? Um, what is the mind-body problem? Well, there are, there are these mental things. Uh, we call them sensations, beliefs, hopes, etc. There are these physical events. There's this physical chain of events leading from the world to states in your brain. Whatever one shows up, the other one is there too. Uh, whenever one is there, the other one is there. And then there is a question about what the relationship between the two things are. And then Descartes says, well, they're separate substances, one interacting with that, with the other, right? So that's the traditional mind-body problem. Um, well, we haven't seen why it's a problem yet, but that's the traditional, at least coming from Descartes, mind-body picture, uh, right? So he's just, again, just setting the problem up at this point, I'm pretty sure. With the coming of 19th century psychology, physiology, and 20th century developments therefrom, of course, we've become extremely suspicious. If we hadn't been suspicious yet by the philosophers of the Enlightenment, such as Hume in England in the 18th century, of uh, the sub su substance conception of both soul and body. So, modern so notice he says uh, there's two reasons to be suspicious of this idea. One is a scientific reason, I think, but the other is coming from the empiricism, from Hume. So what do you think he means there? Well, I think what he means there is that uh, Hume argued that the self wasn't a substance. Um, it was a bundle of perceptions or something like that. Um, so that uh, we don't have any reason to think that there is a substance, a mental substance. Um, is that what he's talking about there? Because he did say Hume, right? Let me just go back real fast. In Enlightenment such as Hume in England in the 18th century of... Uh, the sub su substance conception of both soul and body. So, right, so the substance, oh, right, and there's also the conception of body, right? So that's the part that I was missing, right? Because um, you're right, Hume does attack the kind of notion that there is substance at all, um, or that we have reason to believe that there's substance. I wouldn't say Hume denies that there is substance, but that he thinks that we don't have any reason to believe that there is such a thing called substance. Um, because what we have are experiences, what we have are impressions, and they're neutral, whether there's a substance or not. Um, but what did he, so hold on, let me go, but let me go back. Now, with the coming of 19th century psychology, physiology, and 20th century developments therefrom. 19th century psychology and physiology, that's the 1800s. That's when psychology becomes a science. We have Wundt and Freud and those guys in the 20th century developments. Okay, so then we have reasons to be skeptical of, of that, is what he's saying. Of course, we've become extremely suspicious. If we hadn't been suspicious yet by the philosophers of the Enlightenment, such as Hume in England in the 18th century, of uh, the sub su substance conception of both soul I wonder if what he means by that, because what he says is these developments. So what he, I wonder if he's referring to like the old debate between structuralism and in psychology, where uh, the idea was to use introspection and to identify the structure of one's experience um, and to find the building blocks of it, so to speak, which one could then use to construct any given experience. Um, big debate about Im imageless thoughts or whether coins tilted at an angle appear circular or ovular, like an oval or a circle. Um, that led people to become suspicious of substances, right? And then that led to behaviorism. Um, that's how I view the history anyway. So is that is that what he's talking about here? 1962 behaviorism would be in its heyday, right? It'd be on decline here eventually, but uh, 60s in America at least. Very prominent, I think, right? All right, let's get back to it. Body. So modern philosophers in the 20th century, usually, although there are exceptions, do not put the problem in terms of the relation of two substances. Most of us philosophers have learned to avoid uh, both fallacies, and I'm going to try very hard to avoid these two fallacies that I call, on the one hand, the reductive fallacy, an easy way out of problems by reducing the one entity to the other, if it doesn't uh, quite yield uh, logical analysis, we say, oh, well, it is nothing but. So 
So generally, philosophers have done this for Some of my students know these old jokes of mine. We have philosophies of the nothing but. I put them on the leftist side. Philosophies of the something more. I put them on the rightist side, for obvious reasons. Uh, the philosophers, <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> the philosophers that. Uh, I don't get it, he said. So there's the nothing buts and the something more. So I kind of get that. The reductionists are the nothing buts. The mind is nothing but this. Um, the something more is there's something more than the physical stuff there to the mind. Why do you put them on the right for obvious reasons? Big laugh. I don't know. Um, and I think that's interesting. So he's going to say his position's in the middle somehow. Really? Is that interesting? That's, let's hear what the punchline is. On the left side, commit what is usually called the reductive fallacy. The philosophers on the right side commit what I call the seductive fallacy. <laughs> because they say that over and above the organic processes within the living body, within the living organism, over and above the, pro uh, the processes in your nervous system, central, autonomic, and whatnot, there are mental processes which form an entity distinct, numerically different from the physical processes. And some go so far with the seductive fallacy as to assume that this amounts to an immaterial self or even to an immortal soul. What kind of, what's he saying right there? It's reductive fallacy and something else. Inductive fallacy? I don't know. Something something there. Okay, so they assume there's more. And if you take it all the way, you'll get a substance, like a, a, a non-physical self or soul. But at least you'll get properties that are non-physical if you think there's something more. Um, and that's he's making the distinction between property dualism and substance dualism. Substance dualism being that claim that there's um, two substances, mental and physical. What's a substance? I don't know. Something can have a property, maybe. Uh, so we could get into a debate about that. But anyway, so that would be that claim. So the, the property dualist says there's only one kind of stuff, one substance. It may be physical, but that thing has um, two kinds of properties, physical properties and non-physical properties. And those non-physical properties might be these mental things. Um, so the something more people make are, on his view, wrong. Okay. On the other hand, uh, it is easy to remove the whole problem, so to speak, cutting the Gordian knot by saying, oh well, one or the other of the two, the psychical or the physical, psi and phi, simply is not existent, and there are various philosophies that have tried to do that. Met ah, I see. So he means by a reductive eliminative. I've talked about this before, so some people... So yeah, you might wonder what is the difference between reduction and eliminativism, and some people like Quine have said, well, there really is no difference, because if what you're doing is reduction, then what you're doing is taking one theory and showing how its terms or relations reduce to, or nothing more than um, the, what the another theory at a more basic level is talking about, like how water is reduced to H2O. Uh, you have you know sort of common sense conception of water. And then you reduce that to a chemical theory about hydrogen and oxygen and relations between them and so forth and so on. Um, so, so there, you, you, you could basically eliminate the, the talk of, about water from our language and talk only about H2O. And so talking about water, water doesn't seem to be anything over and above H2O. And so people might say you could eliminate it. That's, you know, it's in a sense, we don't need to talk about water. It's on, you know, what's real is H2O. And you can get all sorts of things about that. Um, and Quine actually says that at, in a different panel, not the one I was reacting to, but one that I saw years ago, um, he says, yeah, there's no difference between eliminating it and reducing it, saying you could get rid of it and, and saying that you found out what it is and that it really is this thing in the other theory. Um, so he's saying that's a mistake because you get rid of the thing that you're talking about. And that I agree with. That sounds to me like a limitivism. Um, and I think that reduction it isn't a limitivism. A limitivism is when you say there's no such thing as the thing that you're talking about. And reductionism is, is when you say the thing you're talking about really is this other thing not a non-existent thing. <laughs> um, now, I don't know. Is that tricky? Because like, take something, for example, like witches. Well, what are witches in folklore? 
women in league with the devil who dance around and brew things and magical pots and stuff like that. Okay. Um, do those things exist? No, but there are these other things like real women who were, I guess I read an article, you guys know about this saying they were brewmasters or something like that. They made beer people, men tried to demonize them and they wore a pointy hat so they could sell their beer. You could see them. I don't know. So I don't know if that's true, but let's suppose it is. So does witches refer to them? Are we talking about them? Are we talking about these magical creatures and saying they don't exist? Or are we saying we're misdescribing those women as magical creatures? I think there's complex issues here about language. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, 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 I hope what he's going to say is that there's a way to say that consciousness is real um, and it's a brain process, even though it's not that like the eliminativism version uh, and it's not the something more version. Right. Let's see what he, where he goes with this. Physical idealism or spiritualism, such as we find. Oh, wait, let me go back because I. By saying, oh, well, one or the other of the two, the psychical or the physical, psi and phi, simply is not existent, and there are various philosophies that have tried to do that. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he said you could say one or the other doesn't exist. So I was focusing on the reductionism of the of the mental, saying the mental doesn't exist. But you could also say the physical doesn't exist. Um, and he's going to say idealism is a version of that. Although you could also say idealism is a is a theory that says the physical is other than we thought that it was. And there again, you get into version of the thing I was just saying. But anyway, so I you, yeah, you get both. You can do both sides, right? So on the one hand, you get the sort of a limitivist about consciousness. On the other hand, you get the idealist about consciousness. He's going to say they're both wrong. And you know, we like that around here. Right? So let's, let's go on. Physical idealism or spiritualism, such yeah. as we find, for instance, in Leibniz, okay. maintains that the mental or mind-like uh, substance is the ultimate reality of the world and that the physical is mere appearance. Philosophers have always played fast and loose with the distinction of appearance and reality, and you can, of course, conjure up all sorts of doctrines if you make the distinctions uh, to suit your purpose. Yeah, okay. On the other hand, uh, in recent times, especially here in America, preceded partly by certain developments in Russia earlier this century, in reflexology... <laughs> Fucking Russians, dude. It's 1962. <laughs> There were developments in Russia, and then they affected us. What? <laughs> what is this? McCarthy era fucking philosophy shit? <laughs> Do we know what he's talking about? It's Pavlov, right? Yeah, Pavlov's the developments in Russia. <laughs> uh, and Pavlov, classical conditioning, and then behaviorism, and then operant conditioning, and then that's what he's talking about here okay <laughs> there were developments in russia oh, man that is hilarious on the other hand uh, in recent times especially here in america preceded partly by certain developments in russia earlier this century in reflexology we find the views of bektoreff and john b watson and so on according to which uh, what we mean by did he say Becherev? Oh, is that how you say that? I thought it was Becherev, B-E-C. Yeah, I don't know a lot about that philosopher either. Okay, but I've, I've heard of that. Anyway, okay, I'm going to stop. Watson talking. and so on, according to which, uh, what we mean by the mind of men or the mind of animals is nothing but their behavior. What can you possibly mean, later behaviorists uh, used to say, by ascribing mental states to an animal or to a fellow human being, except what you can observe objectively, publicly, about his behavior. Okay, right. So that's the been that's the kind of stuff that we were talking about before in the in the equine reaction, right? So the idea is that when, you know, here's this. This is kind of all stemming from the descendants of Wittgenstein's private language arguments. Like, what can you mean? Like, if you're going to mean something, the other person has to understand you. And if you're gonna, if they're gonna understand you, you got to be saying things in a language that they can understand. And if you're using some private language that only you know the meanings of, then no one could ever check and know about it, so they can't know what you're talking about. I mean, I'm doing butchering it, but you know, I'm, hopefully the gesturing is making you know this is serious Wittgenstein scholarship. <laughs> like, 
Come on. So if I say, you know, if I have some internal episode of consciousness that only I know about that gives meaning to my words like red and so forth, then how can we say, you know, how can we talk about the same thing when you say it's red? I'm referring to my private thing. You're referring to your private thing. Are we agreeing? Are we not agreeing? Um, right. So uh, that that's the behaviorist idea there is that what could you even mean when you say that you're seeing red? Oh, well, what you mean is that you say things like I see red and you, you would be disposed to, you know, um, make certain judgments about it, like that is more similar to this or less similar to that, blah, blah, blah. And so that's really what we mean. That's a, So that that's one of the things we we're talking about last time is that they thought that when we talk about the mental, what that means is definitionally something in terms of behavior. And so I think Feigl's going to disagree with that here. He's going to say, no, these aren't definitional terms. I, I think he's going to ultimately end up saying something like these are a posteriori identities. Um, that, that's not something that you can know just by knowing the meanings of words like see or uh, believe or something. Right? Is that where he's going with this? All right, let's let me be quiet. He's gonna talk for a half hour. We've only got through eleven minutes. No, I okay, yeah. <laughs> to an animal or to a fellow human being, except what you can observe objectively, publicly about his behavior. So in slightly more sophisticated forms of behaviorism, we find, for instance, the doctrine that uh, mental predicates, that is, words that stand for mental uh, events or kinds of mental events, really refer to dispositions of, uh, to toward behavior. What does it mean to say that a certain person, let's say, is furious or that he's depressed or that he's elated? Well, it means that under certain stimulus conditions he will react or respond in a certain way this is something that you can observe so that certain dispositional concepts which are all iffy concepts you see if you stimulate the organism in this way then it uh, will respond in this way these concepts of course are quite common in physics if you ask for, ask yourself for instance what do we mean by magnetism in physics ascribing magnetization to an iron bar, we can say, well, if you approach it with little pieces of iron, they will be accelerated toward the ends of what we call the poles of the magnet. You can also put that in quantitative language and measure the pole strength of the magnet and so on and so forth. But in any case, you deal with uh, dispositional properties, which from the point of view of a logical analysis, you might say are nothing but shorthand for if-then statements of this test condition, test result type. Similarly, ascribing mental properties to uh, organisms, for instance, if I ask my esteemed colleague here, a penny for your thoughts, what are you thinking about me now? Of course, he's thinking that I'm a darn fool. <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah, so... Okay, so far he's just describing behaviorism. Right. Uh, notice this is different. This is the other kind of behaviorism than the kind I was talking about last time, like mythological behaviorism, which says, look, if you want to study these things or know about them, you study the behavior. This is saying, look, all there is to the meaning of these terms is uh, behaviors of certain sorts. That's all there is to it. There's nothing more, right? Um, anything else is a category error or mistake or something like that. You're, you're thinking, there should be something more when there isn't. When we thought that's what we mean when we say they have these things, like they hope this or believe that or fear that. They just mean they'll have these, they behave in certain ways in the right circumstances. And there's nothing more to it, right? That is the mind, according to this way of thinking. And that's a different kind of behaviorism than the methodological behaviorism, where it says if you want to study the internal states that you can't access directly, you have to study their, their, the, the objective appearance of them. Uh, which is behavior so that's those are two as i understand it those are two different versions of behaviors anyway okay so let's go back to it i could get that out of him if i give him the penny you see. <laughs> <laughs> i had no idea he was so funny so what he's saying is he said a penny for your thoughts and i guess the person didn't respond or something like that and he said i could get it out of him if i actually had a penny to give him like i give him money <laughs> all right good one you stimulate or you, you want more. <laughs> <laughs> the way he said, or do I have to pay you more? What's it? <laughs> then, uh, 
I could get that out of him if I give him the penny, you see. In other words, the penny will be, the penny will be the stimulus, or you, you want more. He said the grand. So if, if I stimulate him in this way, then this response will be forthcoming. In the, this, the stimulus is the giving of the money, and the response is the telling you what you're thinking about, right? So that's the idea. <laughs> he said, you want more. All right, comedy. In the early days of John B. Watson, why, John B. Watson maintained that thinking, such as you, you and I occasionally do, you know, <laughs> and that, that thinking consists of sub-vocal movements of uh, the speech organs, the larynx, for instance, and our vocal cords. And as far as I know, I think that's been disproven. I don't know, actually. Does anyone know? I, I don't know. I think that's been disproven, the idea that, that when you think thoughts, you make sub vocal like your you can measure vibrations of your vocal cords, but very very minute ones. Um, is that does anyone know about that? I should look that up. That's interesting. Um, I, I'm not saying it never happens, but I, I'm saying that there are cases of thinking where that doesn't happen. I think yeah. But anyway, it's interesting. Okay, let's continue. It can be established experimentally. That is, uh, lots of people when they think, uh, so to speak. They speak sub vocally, they, they, they don't make sounds, but they still move their, their speech organ. Yeah. So uh, he was made fun of, uh, old, uh, good old Watson, by somebody who said uh, Watson had uh, made up his windpipe that he had got no mind. <laughs> this, this, this is the real of the balance. <laughs> Wait, what? Someone made fun of Watson by saying that he said in his windpipe he has no mind. Wait, what? <laughs> and, uh, made up his windpipe that he had got no mind. Wait, made up his windpipe? He was made fun of, uh, old, uh, good old Watson, by somebody who said uh, Watson had uh, made up his windpipe that he had got no mind. <laughs> He'd made up his windpipe that he had no mind. <laughs> that's that's some that's some philosophy humor right there. This, this, this is the real of the balance. This is what? What he said? This, this, this is the real of the balance. This is the reductive fallacy. Yeah, so that's the reductive fallacy that you get you say there is no mind. Something I would say the illusionists are doing currently. <laughs> of course, he was preceded by. It's interesting because it's like now, what's uh, 1962? So it's <laughs> 62, 40, it's like 60 years later almost, and uh, we have exactly the same dichotomy the something mores and the nothing buts, and there uh, are people trying to fight for a middle path. Uh, progress. <laughs> a crasser form of materialism that wait hold on hold on hold on and, uh, made up his windpipe that he had got no mind <laughs> this, this, this is the of the palace because he was preceded by even a crasser form of materialism that of the 18th and 19th centuries according to which uh, there was just no such thing as the mind. I have talked to medical people, for instance, my own son, who was a student of physiology right in this university. He said, Daddy, there is no mind-body problem. I said, how come, how so? He said, well, there is no mind. What you're talking about are brain, are brain processes. So whatever I, I put in terms of... Okay, so, and this is... Yeah, this is something, again, uh, I, I wrote a blog post about this because I, use, I teach a neuroscience class and I have a neuroscience textbook. And the neuroscience textbook was talking about eliminativism and saying that neuroscience is eliminativist about terms like consciousness. And I was like, come on, man. Um, no, you can be reductivist about consciousness. That doesn't mean you have to be an eliminativist about consciousness. You, you can say consciousness is a brain process without saying that consciousness doesn't exist. Instead, what there are are brain processes, which is what the kid was just reported as saying. He said, dad, there is no mind. There's just brain activity. Of course, there's just brain activity, but some of that may be the mind. So, all right, anyway, I'm ranting. <laughs> Let's... Language of uh, 
emotion, of moods, of sensations, of imagery, and so on, he translated immediately into a partly utopian, to be sure, uh, brain physiology, and there was no, there was no convincing him. I sometimes tried uh, pure argumentum ad hominem at him, and I said, suppose you were to undergo a surgical operation, wouldn't you ask for total anesthesia? And if so, is this uh, to serve the purpose merely to uh, prevent your uh, limbs to jerk uh, when the uh, surgeon uh, operates on you, so that would upset the, the, the surgeon and his operation? Or isn't the primary purpose of total anesthesia to prevent the pains that you would experience when the... Is that a fair? That's not fair to the do list though, right? Because what he's saying is, look, if you go undergo surgery, what's the point of anesthesia? Is it just to stop your limbs from moving while you still feel the pain? Obviously, that would suck. So it happens with some people. Uh, but obviously, what we hope it happens is that, that the pain is blocked. But can't the duelist just say, look, you, by blocking certain physical activities, um, you also block certain non-physical properties from showing up because they're correlated with those physical properties. Uh, so there's no pain in that case with the anesthesia because you disactivated the physical properties and therefore the mental properties don't show up. I don't understand what's wrong with that uh, response. I'm not a dualist, obviously, but uh, I don't see what's wrong with that response. So I wonder what he's going to say about that. Let's see. Surgeon puts his uh, knife into you. Well, uh, these are purely emotional arguments, according to these hard-headed materialists. That just doesn't count, you see. Or well, I used to argue in this way. There are some people, you see, who are solipsists. That's a very clear kind of paranoia. Uh, they believe that... Uh, Tholipsism is a kind of paranoia. I'm going to talk to a tholipsist on uh, Consciousness Live in June, so I'll tell him that if I can say that. I don't agree with that, by the way, but uh, it's interesting. They believe that only they exist, that is, their stream of consciousness is the only thing that exists, and the rest of the world... That's one version of solipsism. Another version is that you don't have any reason to believe that other minds exist. Um, or that... And, and because of uh, something about, you know, the private, privateness of our own experience, we, we learn to apply these mental terms only by our own experience or something like that. Does not exist. That is, uh, all the other people are just uh, complexes of their uh, perceptions and sensations. And so to ascribe to somebody else feelings or pains is completely illegitimate. Such a person could... Yeah, so to so the, the version that I was talking about, so to ascribe, to, it's going to agree with that. To to say of another person that they have feelings or pains is illegitimate because those words only have meaning in in relation to kind to your experiences. That's where they get their meaning from, the private thing inside you. So they you can't really apply that to someone else. So you can't really say they're having a pain because pain means the thing you find in you, and it only has that meaning in relation to your experience on this view. Um, on the solipsistic view that we were talking about. So it's unintelligible to say other people have pains. Um, it's like saying other people have your right arm. <laughs> it's just not something that can happen. Uh, so according to the solipsistic view, which I'm not endorsing, but so, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other minds. It just means you don't, you can't make sense of that claim that there are other minds or something like that. As a, so I think you could distinguish those two. It is, and I think uh, it's not clear that this is the only version of solipsism. But they both would say at the end, yes, that it's incoherent to say that other people have minds, but for but for different reasons. Anyway, I, I, I've been boating up on my solipsism because I'm talking to a solipsist. <laughs> and so to ascribe to somebody else feelings or pains is completely illegitimate. Such a person could not have the normal kind of ethical reasoning, I claim, because after all, if, for instance, you uh, abide or wish to abide by the precept to avoid uh, cruelty to your fellow human beings, then that assumes that your fellow human beings experience cruelty very much in the way you do, doesn't it? No, I don't think it does. Does it? I mean, I think instead you could say their suffering is you, you're suffering. So it's like if you have a moral theory about you know, reducing suffering overall, you should still not kill that person even though they don't, you don't think they exist or something. Um, if you really take his view that there's only one mind and they're a part of your mind or something like that as uh, in a dream, you're really causing yourself pain. Um, 
And this is neither here nor there, but I once had a really weird dream like this. I once dreamt that I was, um, <laughs> this is why am I talking about this? This is so stupid. Anyway, I once had a dream uh, that I was robbing a, um, a liquor store or something like that. I had a shotgun. I've been playing too much Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> uh, so I had a shotgun. I was robbing this liquor store. Um, and I came in with a shotgun. I was like, give me your money. And the people were in there. And it was like, you know, just a dream. So it was all chaotic and whatever. But but something happened and the guy behind the counter was doing something. So I, I went to, I shot the guy behind the counter. And I pulled the trigger and then I felt like, oh, somehow I looked down and I had been shot. Like suddenly I was the guy behind the counter and it was like instantaneous. I pulled the trigger and I felt the kickback of the gun and the kickback of the gun caused me to look down. And when I looked down, I realized I had been shot and I was in pain and I was on the floor or whatever. And then I woke up. I was like, holy moly. All right. Video games, dude. <laughs> video games. Okay. So uh, in that case, like the person I shot was me, right? Um, that, that's the kind of idea that I was going for because in the dream, it was all me. I was the guy behind the counter. I was everybody in there was sort of me in a sense. And so it was a very vivid experience. I'm reading too much into it. That's not how I felt at the time, but I'm just saying that this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking of as an encounter example to what Feigl's saying here. Is that, but of course, then you might argue, well, no, what if I'm a masochist and I like watching, you know, making myself suffer or something like that. And so I kill other people as a way to get my sick enjoyment. So I'm not saying that this entails like kind of moral theory, but I'm saying it's not impossible that you could have a moral theory on solipsism that said, don't kill other people. Right? I mean, anyway. The cruelty to your fellow human beings, and that assumes that your fellow human beings experience cruelty very much in the way you do, doesn't it? But again, my opponents will say, oh, this is a purely sentimental argument that has no philosophical validity at all. You can, you can prove the existence of God and the way mortality by arguments of that sort. All right, so I see what he's doing overall, the dialectical strategy here. So he's saying, look, okay, so... Um, you, you have these two camps, so you have this, these two things here, the, the mental and the physical, right? Um, uh, we've been talking about that, and they seem to correlate. Wherever there's the one, there's the other. So what are you going to do here? Well, you have these two camps. The one camp that says, look, there's nothing there. Uh, you get rid of the mind or you get rid of the physical, and so you either have only the mind or you have only the physical uh, by, by getting rid of the other one. And on the other hand, you say, well, there's something more, some non-physical thing hanging around um so so there are pro so he's saying here's some problems with the sort of getting rid of the physical stuff but they're not really logical arguments they're kind of just like gee isn't that weird kind of arguments like solipsism isn't contradictory it's just very very counterintuitive same with other kinds of views so the the opponent might say those aren't really good arguments for for thinking that the mind is the physical or, you know, for denying dualism or solipsism or any of these other views about the relation between the mind and the body. So like what reasons do we have really to go one way or the other? That's, and then I'm thinking he's building up to an argument here. Is this going to be his famous pneumological danglers? Is that where we're going? Let's, let's see. Anyway. No, I'm not so convinced. Anyway. The question is, if neither extreme behaviorism or, or materialism on the reductive side or some sort of a dualistic interactionism with a substantial or non-substantial soul will be, will be a satisfactory solution, is there between a philosophy of the something more and the nothing but some other philosophy, maybe a philosophy of the what what, which avoids both the reductive and... <laughs> We want to avoid the not something more and the nothing but, and we're going to go with the what's what. <laughs> guys, <laughs> I got to step up my lecture game, guys. I don't give talks that are this funny. <laughs> reductive fallacy and gives us a constructive or a reconstructive account of what's going on in this very complex field. Pardon me for jazzing up this enormously complex problem. A few years ago, it took me some 120 pages merely to summarize the main aspects of this very complex problem, but perhaps we can come to grips and I can come to happy or unhappy conclusion before my esteemed colleagues start shooting at me um, by showing you what the difficulties are in this mind-body problem. Personally, impressed as I am with the progress of psychophysiology, particularly of neurophysiology and the kind of explanations, incomplete though they are, that they have given of human behavior, 
I feel that some sort of a monistic solution, that is of a mind-body unity, is from a scientific point of view the most desirable. But I'm very anxious to avoid the reductive fallacies of behaviorism and materialism. That is, I would like to do justice to the direct subjective or private experience that we all have so keenly, and that <coughs> plays such a role, let us say, when we want to avoid pain or when we I want to prevent uh, 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 cruelty to others, which is again belief that the other person has pains very much in the same sense in which we directly experience them and in which we know them from immediate experience or by acquaintance. Okay, so this is exactly, I say bravo, yes. Um, this is what I was talking about yesterday or <laughs> the, in the last video. Where I said I think materialists or physicalists they, they give up the game too easy by adopting behaviorism of the day and saying look here's a physicalist theory, uh, and that's exactly what he's saying here. He's saying look I, I think that monism is better. I don't want to be a dualist. I don't want to go there's a something more, but I'm not going to go behaviorism. So when he says you know or limitivism, I'm not going to say consciousness doesn't exist or that you know we want to endorse the reality of the of the of the consciousness of the conscious mind of consciousness as a phenomenon in reality. Uh, but if we want that to be physical we want and that's been i've been trying to pound this and bring this back because i think a lot of the debate really between physicalists and dualists this gets lost um between the loudest voices in the room being in extremes here um and the sensible position that that we're developing here which i very much am keen to defend um is the idea that uh consciousness is real but still physical we don't eliminate it it's not an illusion. It's a real thing. It's a physical thing. Um, it's a brain thing. I like it. Uh, it's exactly the attitude I think we should have. Uh, and let's continue. So, one distinction that, that has been drawn traditionally, and perhaps all of these distinctions can be exploded. I'm not putting them down dogmatically as my opinion at all. I merely try to bring them out that these are the points that have to be resolved if we are to have a satisfactory philosophical solution of a satisfactory solution of the philosophical problem of the relation of the mental to the physical. So the mental is said to be subjective. There are many senses to that. I'll pick out the most important, perhaps, namely, that, for instance, my pain is not your pain. This is so obvious, so truistic, that nobody will doubt it. Uh, what would dentists do if they suffered the pains that they inflicted upon, <laughs> the upon their patients, you see? So, I experience my own private data of consciousness. You can, if you will, infer them on the basis of my behavior, my behavior gives you symptoms and signs thereof, and any doctor makes use of my introspective evidence. Just yeah, so, right, consciousness is real. Our stream, the mind is a real thing. We have conscious experiences. Um, <clears throat> good, so we're, we're, that's what we're saying here. Um, uh, so it's subjective, but nonetheless physical, right? Okay. I was going to say something about uh, the pain thing, but um, let's let's just go on because I see we're almost we're at the twenty minute mark. We're almost done. I think we'll make it through just Feigl. Then maybe I'll come back and do the rest of these, and maybe I'll do three parts: one for Feigl, one for Firebond, and then one where they discuss or interact. The harmless camp. You don't have to go to the psychiatrist or psychologist. Take the oculist. He asks you, uh, "Can you still see the last line on, <laughs> on this on this chart?" You say, well, that's kind of blurred. Well, he takes your word for it. Or, or the doctor asks you, does it hurt more here than there? No. You know, how could he know, you see? Of course, he gets to know by your reactions, which include, of course, very prominent. I mean, this point's so obvious, you wonder why somebody smart like this has to make the point, and the answer is because behaviorism at the time, and the way it was interpreted. So he's saying, yeah, you may maybe outward signs of what's going on, but uh, the, the eye doctor doesn't know whether it's blurry or not, except by asking you. Um, and uh, what, what, what they're asking you is, um, you know, tell me about your experience. <laughs> is it blurry or not what, with this lens or that lens? Okay, good. Not yeah. in the human case, our verbal reaction. Yeah. 
But most of us, I don't think this is sheer sentimentality, ascribe feelings also to dogs and cats or domestic animals. So they are not uh, even able to report about them. They, are, they don't have any reporting mechanism in the sense of language, but they are plenty expressive in their behavior. All right. The feeling. So wait, what is he saying? They express their mental states, but they don't report them. But he, he was he saying we deny them thoughts? And I, I think the common sense view is that they clearly do have them. Um, but anyway, okay, I'm getting distracted. That's not relevant, though. Let's continue. That we have, the emotions that we have, the sensations we have are in this sense private and not public. Right. And the sense in which, for instance, our behavior is subject to uh, public uh, inspection. All of you can watch my facial expression now, my lifting my hands and so on, whereas only I can tell you how nervous I feel about this impossible lecture. <laughs> <laughs> then, this is the inheritance from Descartes. I asked him a penny for your thoughts. If I had asked him how many inches long is your thought of uh, nationalism, for instance. <laughs> then you have the traditional answer of the philosophers is not this, <laughs> but they say the question doesn't make sense as far as <laughs> mental events are concerned. How, how many ounces does your uh, jealousy weigh that you experience when your wife has an affair with somebody else? Uh, <laughs> How many ounces does your jealousy weigh when your wife has an affair with someone else? <laughs> uh, okay. Makes no sense in physical terms. Unless you're an identity. So, non, non spatial, spatial, non -spatial. Uh, qualitative, quantitative. I won't, I won't uh, devote too much time. All right. So he's going through the list of things that Descartes said were. Uh, I see, I forgot what was going on here. So he's going through the list of things that Descartes said were properties of the mental. So non-spatial being one of them. Subjective, private, okay. Um, those sorts of things. Uh, so you can't say like how long a thought is or how many ounces it is if it's not a spatial or extended object, okay. So that, so that, uh, this is a misunderstanding anyway. Physics, for instance, is both qualitative and quantitative, but traditionally much has been made of this, namely that we can, for instance, compare according to similarity to dissimilarity such experiential qualities as colors or sounds as, as heard in music or as appreciated when we look at nature or at paintings and so on and uh, that uh, physics comes in when we uh, begin to measure let's say wavelengths or frequencies of light, light or intensities of sound in decibels and so on and so forth. It's been said that the mental is purposive that is, we are all goal-directed, goal-striving organisms. This was even of the lowly rats, the favorite experimental animal of the psychologist. They pursue certain goals, such as food and drink and so on. Yep. Whereas mm. the purely physical is supposed to be mechanical <coughs> only. There are lots of misunderstandings in this, and I wouldn't for a moment uh, begin to defend it. Similarly, indefensible, I think, is the distinction of the mimic and the non-mimic, namely that uh, only minds have memory and that uh, physical objects cannot have memory. That's already refuted by magnetic tape nowadays. All right, so what's he saying? So yeah, right, there are physical things that are minds that have memory, right? So okay, anyway. Um. So uh, another dif difference that has been made is that minds in a, are in a genuine sense emergent over and above the physical. That is that there is something that is unpredictable on the basis of physical antecedent, whereas the purely physical world is compositional in nature in the way in which, for instance, the system of pulleys is compositional, that you can figure out what the total effect of a set of pulleys is if you know your law of the lever and if you know how many pulleys you are and how the string... Yeah, so here's a kind of epistemological gap sort of argument here. Um, <clears throat> many people think that you can't infer the the mental from the physical, but you can infer all sorts of things about other physical properties. Like, you know, if you knew about this contraption, about the levers and pulleys, and you, you could deduce like what it would do. With all these pulleys, <coughs> for compositional as uh, contracted with emergent. And finally, 
Frank Brentano, Austrian philosopher of the last century in Vienna, maintained that the prime characteristic of the mental is its intentionality. In other words, that all mental events are such that they are about or of something. Right. In modern times, we would say representational, that they represent something, but that they are intentional, they are of or about something. Um, and and Brentano, Brentano thought that was the mark of the mental, that that's what made a mental thing was that it had, but more specifically, that it had something called intentional in existence, that it could uh, be about things that didn't exist. Um, like when you know, I'm looking for the fountain of youth, what I'm looking for is a non-existent object, but that's, that's, what I, that's what the intentional object of my thought is. That's what it's about, is this fountain of youth, this thing that doesn't exist. So this is, again, you're just going through a list of properties that mental objects are, have been famously said to have, or mental objects, mental you know, that that the mental has been said to have, and then, okay, so what's he going to say about it? If I love, I love somebody or something. If I think, I think about something. If I wish, I wish for something, and so on and so forth. There's, so to speak, an arrow that is directed from the act upon the object. There is no such thing in physical nature. If you say that there are time samples, for instance, this is the way to Duluth, it might say, this is our mental interpretation of what that is. It's just a piece of wood that is pointed in a certain direction. It is not intentional in this sense. So this is an array, a fair sample, perhaps not a complete list, of all the sharp distinctions that have been made between the mental and the physical. I Notice intentionality. Some people do think it can, it, it can be physically, uh, you can understand it physical in physical terms, like in terms of causal historical relationships, functions, uh, maybe information being carried. So, you know, this is maybe it, it, these things do exist in nature, like the tree rings, maybe they represent or carry information about some low level intentional, like that's about the age in some sense of the, um, anyway, so this is something we could debate, but all right, so these are the main list of the attributes. Wonderful. I will not take any more time. I will merely indicate that perhaps, uh, perhaps discuss more fully later when Professor Fryer has had his say that my own hope for a monistic solution arises out of the tradition that begins in modern times with Spinoza, although there in a profoundly metaphysical form, which I reject, namely a double aspect view, which you find in Spinoza to some extent also in Leibniz, according to which the mental and the physical are two sides of the same thing. But I would never put it that way myself. I would say that we have a conceptual system, and that's physics, including chemistry, physiology, neurophysiology, and so on. This conceptual, by means of this conceptual system, we are able to designate not only events and processes which are completely unconscious or non-mental, such as the processes that might be going on in a decaying dead brain, after all, physical chemical processes take place in that too, but we have no reason to assume that there's any awareness or consciousness there. But this language of physics, including the language of neurophysiology, is also uh, so constituted as to designate uh, those events and direct experiences and qualities that you and I are familiar with by acquaintance. In other words, the solution that I have pursued but with which I'm not fully satisfied as yet, is roughly this. Just as, for instance, in language we may have two different names, n sub 1 and n sub 2, for the same individual, like Cicero and Tully. Those are two names given to the same old Roman orator, or William Thompson, the famous uh, 19th century English physicist. Later on he was called Lord Kelvin. Two names for the same person. Or we can have a name and a description. By description I mean a unique characterization, such as, for instance, the name William Shakespeare and the description the author of King Lear. Or we can have two descriptions, two different descriptions. All right, we see what's going on here, right? There's two different ways of picking up the same thing. Um, so you can pick out the same guy by calling him Cicero or Tully, um, by calling him um, uh, Machiavelli or Tupac Shakur. <laughs> uh, you could call him, uh, you know, 
he, this guy is the author of that. So that's a name and a description. That they, so the author of that thing, King Lear was it, whatever. Um, uh, the performer of Hit Him Up <laughs> and Tupac Shakur pick out the same guy, but uh, one's a description, one's a name, and you could have two descriptions. All right, so you get the idea that the basic idea is that the, the that he's trying to propose here is that look, mental terms don't have as their meaning. Excuse me, yeah, mental terms don't have as their meaning physical stuff, but rather it's more like this that there's these two languages, um, these two words, these two terms, or whatever, and they just so happen to pick out the same thing. Um, and so some just physical descriptions, it just so happens that it picks out some conscious experience. Um, uh, and so that's that's what it is. It's just, you know, contingently identical. It happens that we learn by empirical discovery that um, this mental term, it, it picks out that physical thing over there. Um, okay. Piece of one and piece of two, such as the author of King Lear is identical with the author of Hamlet. Now this is the model that I'm using. I apply right, and this exactly is where you know people like Kripke are going to come in and, and object. Are going to say, "Look, these identity claims are contingent in the way that you know the things that you're talking about are." Um, like uh, that, Tupac Shakur is a performer of uh, "Hit Him Up," is contingent because someone else may have performed that song, and Tupac may have never become a rapper. In which case, that description picks out someone else. Um, but Tupac will pick out the same guy, right? So that they. One seems necessary, Tupac is. Tupac is necessary, but Tupac performed that song. Doesn't seem necessary. Therefore, uh, they, they seem different. That's what Kripke is going to argue, as, a, as opposed to this kind of view right here. But uh, but I think what he's, the strategy here is, of course, you know, it says, look, you know, we're, we're not saying something ridiculous, like the mind doesn't exist and all there's behavior. We're saying the mind is this physical state. It's just that the mental term picks it out in terms of how you experience it. And the language of physics picks it out in terms of its physical properties, but they're picking out the same thing in just the same way that Superman and Clark Kent pick out the same guy, Cicero and Tully pick out the same guy, Tupac and performer of that song pick out the same guy. It's just that we have different ways of picking out the same object. That's been a, a, a kind of traditional defense of physicalism. To the mind-body problem by saying that... Uh... But in the one language, the language of introspective or phenomenological psychology, I call the emotion of being elated or the emotion of being depressed, which I know by acquaintance, I've had both kinds of conditions. Most of you have been blue at times, I trust, and know what I'm talking about, elated at other times. Just have a couple of cocktails. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what I designate by these words that that uh, simply identify or, or label, label, in terms of label, L. Emotional conditions that I can be aware of by introspection <coughs> is also designated by, let us say, a neurophysiological characterization of the state of my brain. I fully realize that neurophysiology is by far not so advanced that we can give this in any detail. If we could, we could have a sort of uh, dictionary, size five again, with uh, mental terms as we, as we coin them or as we use them. And Why do I always think I'm not recording? <laughs> so we know what's going on here though, right? He's saying that just like you could have two terms that pick out the same stuff, um, you could have the description as it appears, like as I, I feel it, so it feels like this to me. And uh, brain say X9 interaction 4273 to do, those two things which seem very different may in fact pick out the same object unbeknownst to us they may seem very different but they may in fact pick out the same thing that's the basic idea that he's defending on speech uh, on the introspective side and with the corresponding neurophysiological uh, terms on the other side there would be gaps here on the left side because in dreamless sleep or in a complete swoon of course there'd be nothing on this side and uh, there would be processes on the neurological side 
I have not discussed, but I really shouldn't take any more time, the problems of the unconscious that have come to the fore so much in modern psychology and psychoanalysis. I think an account of this sort can take care also of this naughty problem by saying that uh, the unconscious is, can be designated by neuro, in principle, designated by neurophysiological uh, concepts, although we would be hard put to give, let's say, a physiological theory of psychoneurosis nowadays, and at the same time lend themselves to at least a metaphorical description in terms of uh, introspective <coughs> concepts. That is, when we speak of unconscious wishes, unconscious tendencies, unconscious conflicts, we're using introspective terminology, but with the proviso that we're referring to things of which we are at least at the time not aware of which, if Freud is right, they are so deeply repressed that we cannot mobilize them at the moment. To summarize, I've tried to give you all right, so let me just stop right there real fast because, you know, we don't need to get hung up with Freud. Freud's view, view of the unconscious is very different than the contemporary cognitive unconscious. Um, but, you know, so we can replace everything he said about Freud's unconscious with our view. But uh, the point there, I think, is that um, he, he said he hasn't talked about that, but you, you would have to give a distinction between, you could say the unconscious mental stuff is still physical, but you'd have to somehow say what distinguishes the physical brain activity, which is conscious from the physical brain activity, which is not. Um, and then maybe you could tell a story about that. Uh, I, I think you need a psychological level story. That's where higher order theories, I think, really shine, of course, as opposed to a neurophysiological story. Um, but then if you're talking about disorders, which he seemed to switch to. Um, then there, I think, yeah, you could give a physicalistic account of these kinds of things anyway. So that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> And he hasn't talked about that, but is this the end of his point? Because if so, let's go ahead and knock off here. In very rapid fire fashion, a few of the difficulties and quandaries that have plagued the philosophers, at least for the last 300 years, in bringing the mental and the physical together. Some of us, like myself, are still working on this and bringing them together. Other people have maintained that this is a pseudo problem and uh, uh, not fit for either scientists or philosophers. I would wish to distinguish scientific problems, such as can be resolved by further research in neurophysiology, in psychophysiology, and so on, and philosophical problems, which we can tackle by logical analysis of the meanings of the terms, and the meanings of the statements that we use in our uh, sciences, such as psychophysiology. Okay, so I think that's the end. You know, it's interesting because you still see this this distinction between sort of view that he's going to be arguing against here nowadays too, because we have analytic functionalism, which claims that you can kind of define mental terms a priori in terms of functional descriptions, which isn't strictly speaking behaviorism, but it's like a, a, a legacy or down, you know, descendant of that sort of view. Um, so I think Firebrand's going to be discussing limitivism. Uh, I only know the Rorty, like the historical limitivism, I only know Rorty um, and his version of it. So I don't really know a lot about that. But we'll save that video for the next time, um, which I'm definitely going to get to if people are interested in it. And we will uh, continue. All right.